Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program which seeks to bring understanding to God's Word, the Bible. Currently, we are working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. We are in chapter 18, and let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, as we continue to study the book of Matthew, particularly Matthew 18 and what Jesus says about forgiveness, we pray, O oh Lord, we would take it to heart and that we might forgive as, in fact, we have been forgiven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we heard the disciples ask Jesus, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To answer that question, Jesus called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus mean when he says this? Well, we heard yesterday that he means that every one of us enters into the kingdom of heaven through humble trustfulness. The words change and become in this passage describe an action of the heart one that is possible only through the power of grace. And it should not be reduced to a mere change of conduct. No, this is a true change of heart, a regeneration, a conversion. Then Jesus said, Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We do not achieve greatness in the kingdom of heaven by seeking to be great. We become great by humbling ourselves, by being little. Our attitude is completely wrong if we are doing anything to promote ourselves above other fellow believers. If God raises us up to positions of authority, that's one thing. If we raise ourselves up, that's quite another thing altogether. We were given another way to think about greatness and humbleness yesterday. We considered a vessel or a container that can hold something. If the vessel or the container is already full, nothing can be added to it. Likewise, if we are full of ourselves, great in our own eyes, then God can't add anything to us. However, on the other hand, if the vessel or the container is empty, virtually anything can be added to it. Likewise, if we've become empty because we've humbled ourselves, then God can add whatever he would like to us. We will be able to hold it, and God will be able to use us to carry out his kingdom purposes. We learned yesterday also, as we were studying Matthew chapter 18, what we are to do in the event of a fellow believer sinning against us. Jesus speaks of this beginning in verse 15 of Matthew 18. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The very first step in the process of reconciliation is this. If a fellow believer sins against us, we are to personally go to that person and show them what they've done. Show them how they've sinned against us. This is the most important step. It is to be done in confidence. It is between us and the believer who sinned against us. No one else is to know about it. The reason for this is simple. Reconciliation is much easier to obtain when the conversation is between us and the one who sinned against us. If the person does not receive us, if the person does not listen to what we have to say, then and only then we are to tell the matter to one or two others and together, we would go to the offending believer. Again, no one else is to know about what is going on. The matter is still held in confidence. Again, if the offending person listens, wonderful. The relationship has been restored. 
Should the offending party not listen, then and only then is the matter taken before the church. Hopefully, the person will listen to the church. If not, Jesus said, if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Notice here that it is only to the one sinned against that the offending party is to be treated as a pagan or a tax collector. That is, as an outsider, someone not to be associated with on a personal basis. And we might ask the question, well, why is that? The reason is this, because by their refusal to listen to the one who has come and told them how they have committed a sin, they, by their own actions, are declaring that they don't belong to the church. Later on, however, if this same person repents, then we are to forgive them and restore them to our fellowship. I did mention yesterday that regarding these instructions from Jesus in this text, a sin actually must have been committed. By this I mean that everyone in the church would define what had gone on, the wrong that had been committed, as a sin. There is a difference between a sin being committed and our feelings getting hurt. Some people simply take offense way too easily. Everything offends them. Any little slight by someone, these folks make into a huge mountain. This, quite frankly, is our problem and not anyone else's problem. And we need to stop our childish behavior. A really great prayer is to ask God to mold and shape us in such a way that we are unoffendable. If we are unoffendable, then nothing will cause offense. This is indeed Christ-like behavior and very much worth imitating, very much worth asking our God to give us. I also mentioned yesterday that we need to listen to the person who is maybe accusing us of sinning against them. Let's not blow off the person or shrug our shoulders or say, oh, whatever. The reconciliation between believers is huge in God's sight. The love we have for each other shows the world Jesus. When we are at odds with fellow believers, the world can't see Jesus in us. Do we know what God wants of us? We know that Jesus prayed that we may be one even as the Godhead is one. And so we need to be doing our part in maintaining unity in the church. We now come to Matthew 18, verse 21. Jesus has the opportunity to teach his disciples about forgiveness. I'm going to read the text and then I'm going to play a CD of a message that I gave to the congregation I serve on this passage. Afterward, I'll pray and bless you as I do each day. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master, everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now this is the text for the meditation we are about to listen to. Does everybody have a penny? All right, just making sure you're... Peter asked the question of Jesus. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? 
Up to seven times? And Jesus answered him, I tell you not seven times, but seventy times seven. Now Peter was being generous. He was being generous because you see, in those days the rabbis were teaching that you only had to forgive somebody three times. Three strikes and you're out. Now Jesus' answer could be thought of, okay, keep a tally sheet. Oh, well, that's one. 489 to go. <laughs> Just keep ticking them off. Keep ticking them off. Keep ticking them off until no more left. But that's not what Jesus meant either. You see, the number seven has great significance for the Hebrew people. Great significance for the Hebrew people. And then, if you've got seven times ten, which is, of course, 70, the 70 for the 70 times seven, ten times seven is very significant. In other words, Jesus is saying, very, you know, pay real attention to this. The number seven for the Hebrew people was understood to be God's number. God's number. The number six is said to be man's number because, you see, we were created on the sixth day. Six is our number, which is why you know that wonderful number in Revelation 666? It's not about some weird beast. The threefold six says it's a man. It's a man. But we're not there today. The number seven is said to be God's number, and God is perfect in every way. And so what Jesus was telling Peter was not forgive up to 490 times. He was saying forgive like God forgives. Forgive perfectly, fully, totally, and completely. That's what he was saying. Now to further explain what he meant, you know, to really drive it home, Jesus told a parable. And he said the kingdom of heaven is like... Jesus told many parables like this. The kingdom of heaven is like, you know, comparing things that they could understand so that then they could make the, the jump, the leap from, you know, how people deal with everybody here to how God deals with people. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle debts, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So we're going to divide it into three scenes. Now, I have to warn you in advance. When I get to the end of scene three, you're going to go, pastor's going to say amen. No. I'm going to go to an auxiliary text. But I know that people do that when they sit in their pews. They think, she's winding down. She'll say amen any time now. And I'm going to say, no, I'm going to rev it up again. <laughs> Just warning you, okay? Just warning you. Scene one, a man was brought in to the master, brought into a king who owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, a talent was a weight of measure, okay? Now, I did the math yesterday, and you know what? Calculators don't have this many dec decimals. So I had to get out. Okay. In other words, the 10,000 talents meant that this man owed his master $19,200,000. Now, a typical day's wage in those days was a denarius per day, or 16 cents per day. Now, this man, when he's begging his master, saying, be merciful to me, be patient with me, and I will pay back everything at 16 cents per day. <laughs> it will take him 120 million days, or roughly, roughly 329, 320, 329,000 years. Well, nobody lives that long. <laughs> In other words, it was this impossibly huge debt he would never be able to pay off, ever, ever, ever. So his master ordered he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold so that the debt could be paid. And that's when the man fell on his knees and said, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. Be patient with me. 
falling, begging before his master, I will pay it all back. And the master had pity on him and he canceled all the debt. He canceled it. Now what a relief that would have been to that man. Scene two. The man goes out of the king's presence, out of his master's presence. And our text says that he goes out and he finds somebody who owes him a hundred denarii. Grabbed him by the throat and began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe. Whew. His fellow servant fell on his knees and said the exact same thing that the man had just said to his master. Be patient with me and I will pay back everything. Rather than have pity on this man, rather than have compassion on him as his master had had on him, this man threw his fellow servant into prison until he could pay the death. Now, now you know, I have never understood that mentality, and I know it's been done, you know, in, in our culture and other cultures. You know, how do you pay back a debt when you're in prison? That doesn't even make any sense to me. But now let's look at the comparison, the, the real comparison of the debts here. This man didn't owe millions of dollars. He whole owed 100 denarii. He owed 100 days wages. And at 16 cents per day, the man owed 16 bucks. $16! The man who had the guy by the throat had been forgiven a debt of $19,200,000. Or 10 million times greater than the man owed him. $19,200,000 compared to 16 bucks. Well, he had him thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. Well, this didn't happen in a vacuum. There were witnesses who saw what had happened, and they were greatly distressed, and so they went to their master and told their master exactly what had happened. Scene three. The master now called that servant that he had forgiven in. And this is what he said, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, the text said that this master, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all the debt. In other words, the forgiveness that had been given to him was revoked because he had not forgiven the teeny weeny little debt that his fellow servant had against him. This man who had been forgiven all this humongous debt would end up being tortured forever because how does anyone pay back a debt in jail? much less something that, that is that big. Is unforgiveness worth what it will cost us? That is, our being tortured forever in hell if we do not forgive those who sin against us. Is it worth it? Now, all of you got pennies. Where'd mine go? Hold up your penny. Then you're going to make this real, okay? As real as possible. Imagine for a second what this penny would look like if it was smashed into 10 million pieces. What would it look like? Dust. Yes, dust. It would look like dust. You know, dust. Okay? It would be nothing but dust. And one ten millionth of that dust would be nothing but a mere speck. One ten millionth, that's what that man owed. The man who wouldn't forgive him. A, pet, a speck of dust. A speck of dust compared to all that the other man had owed his master. But he would not forgive a speck of dust. He wouldn't forgive it. And what that lack of forgiveness did for him is it purchased for him a one-way ticket to the jailers and torture forever. Now, how many of us want to purchase a one-way ticket 
to the torture chambers of hell for unforgiveness. I hope none of us want to purchase that. It's like, ah. Oh. And yet, you know, there are people, even Christians, who say that there are things they're just never going to forgive. I have heard it with my own ears. People talk about things they're not ever going to forgive. And they really mean it. They really don't have any intention whatsoever to forgive those who have sinned against them. Even though what, comparatively, how we have sinned against Almighty God and the sins that have been committed against us amount to a mere speck of dust. That's all it amounts to. Now, we tend to think God is loving, and yes, he is. God is forgiving, yes, he is. We forget, though, that God has said in his word, in this particular parable, that he will revoke the forgiveness he has given to us already if we don't forgive. That's what he says. There will be Christians in hell. There will be. People who don't understand this text and don't understand that God means what he says and says what he means. He says, forgive as you have been forgiven. If we don't, we are in eternal trouble. The conclusion of the parable points all to this. That's what it does. It points all to this. After the man is thrown into thrown to the jailer to be tortured by them forever. Jesus said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. That's, he, that's how Jesus' heavenly Father, which is, of course, our heavenly Father, will treat each of us if we don't forgive from our heart. So how then does God expect us to forgive? He expects us to forgive completely totally, fully, perfectly, from the heart, just as he has forgiven us. That's what he says. No ifs, ands, or buts. There aren't any excuses. I mean, there is nobody on planet Earth who is a Christian where there is an exception clause in heaven for them. No, nope. what Jesus says, he means for every single one of us. Every single time we are sinned against, we are to forgive every single time. We have no excuse not to forgive because comparatively the sins that people commit against us are just dust compared to all the sins that we commit against God. Really? Just a little speck of dust. This applies to every one of us. Now, just in case we think maybe Jesus got it wrong that day when he told that parable. Not that he would ever give, get it wrong, but just in case we're thinking he got it wrong that day, let's go to the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, and we've got a petition there, says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us as, that little two-letter word says a lot. Forgive us, Lord, in the same way that we forgive other people. But you know what I found out yesterday when I was going through the Greek? The word forgive in the Greek is a command. It is a verb in the imperative. And what we are saying to God in that particular prayer is, you, God, forgive us as we forgive other people. It's a command. We are commanding God to forgive us in the same way we forgive other people. Yowza. God expects us to forgive as we have been forgiven. No oh, if, ands, buts, excuses, no exceptional clauses anywhere, no little fine print that says, Pastor Kathleen is exempt from that one. Or anybody else could put their name in the blank. No. Because, you see, compared to, I mean, even if somebody really sinned against us a lot, still, it would still be a speck of dust compared to all of the sins that we sin against God. There is no comparison. And God has forgiven us that humongous debt that we owe him. Now, Dylan made a very interesting comment during the children's message. And that was, he said, well, they have to do the forgiving first. Well, that would be nice, except that isn't the way it works. We would like people to come to say, I'm sorry. I was really wrong. Well... We've even got an example of how that doesn't work that way 
in the scriptures. Jesus was hung on a cross. There was not a single person at the foot of the cross who was nailing him there going, forgive us. And yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they didn't. Father, forgive them. None of us want to find ourselves with any unforgiven debt when we, you know, get called in front of our Heavenly Father. Because you see, all it takes is one unforgiven sin to land us into eternal torment. We must forgive as we have been forgiven. It truly is a matter of love. We are commanded to love as we have been loved. We have been commanded to forgive as we have been forgiven. Think about the penny smashed into 10 million pieces. It's just a piece of dust. Are we, are we not going to do what the Lord wants us to do? Now, if it should be that there are folks among us who have said, well, I'm never going to forgive so-and-so. I just can't forgive that. It's not a can't, it's a won't. It's a won't forgive that. I heard an interesting definition of lack of forgiveness this past weekend. Lack of forgiveness or, or the unwillingness to forgive somebody is actually saying, you're better than they. They don't deserve to be forgiven. Really. Who are we to say that? We have been forgiven every single one of our sins. If, in fact, we haven't forgiven someone, let's repent. Today's a really good day to forgive those who have sinned against us. Heavenly Father, we pray, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. And I pray that the as means that we are forgiving as you have forgiven us. Heavenly Father, we have, we have committed more sins against you than we could possibly count. And not a single one of us wants that forgiveness revoked because we were too stubborn and too full of pride to forgive someone who has sinned against us. We ask you, Heavenly Father, for the will today to forgive as you have forgiven us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And so, Heavenly Father, I lift everyone up to you, and I thank you for all that you are doing among us. I now bless them all in that wonderful name of Jesus, and with the blessing that you gave Moses to give to Aaron. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining, Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www dot livingwordradio.org If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.